today is um, our research day and it's combined with the Stephen Fyans uh, 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 lectureship. Um, research day is a day and a half. Uh, many of you have been participating. Uh, we do this annually. Uh, yesterday we had a posters presentation. Today we're having oral and poster presentations. Um, I want to mention that um, uh, after Grand Rounds today, uh, the posters, uh, uh, please go to Towsley. Um, the posters are going to be hanging. Please take a look at them and, and uh, listen to what, our, what the wonderful work our residents have done. There will be a dessert reception as well as something to drink over there as well. Um, as mentioned, today is uh, also uh, our Stefan Fines lectureship. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Bill Herman, who is the Stefan Fines professor, uh, introduce our esteemed speaker and the rationale behind the Stefan Fines lectureship. So, Bill. Thank you, John. I'm delighted to uh, introduce the Stefan Fiennes lecture today. This lecture is given in honor of Stefan Fiennes, who was the uh, director or the, the uh, division chief in endocrinology and metabolism for many years. He was an outstanding clinician, researcher, teacher, and leader and also a devoted father. And I'm happy to say that his sons, Peter and John and their wives, Danny and um, Luann, are here today. Um, Steve Fiennes was born in 1918. He received his undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of Michigan. Uh, he then served in the US Army Corps in Europe during World War II and actually landed at uh, Omaha Beach three days after the initial landings in D-Day. He returned to the U.S. and joined the faculty here at the University of Michigan in 1946 and grew through the ranks. He was chief of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism. He was the founding director of the Diabetes Research and Training Center, which has been continuously funded now for 42 years. He served as president of the American Diabetes Association, vice president of the Endocrine Society, and was a member of the Institute of Medicine. His research focused on the diagnos diagnosis and classification of diabetes, and he was known for the Fiennes and Kahn criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes. He also spent over 50 years studying maturity onset diabetes of the young, or MODI. It was his clinical acumen that permitted him to recognize this autosomal dominant form of type 2 or of diabetes. Uh, he initially described a genetic marker associated with MODI and was able to define the phenotype as being related to deficient insulin secretion. And later in his career, he actually, in collaboration with Graham Bell at the University of Chicago, described the gene associated with MODI1, which is HNF1-alpha. Uh, so today, we're happy to celebrate the 10th annual Fiennes Lecture and our speaker today is Guillermo Umperez. Dr. Umperez is a professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at Emory University, Chief of Diabetes and Endocrinology at Grady Memorial Hospital, and Director of the Emory Latino Diabetes Education Program. Much like Steve Fiennes, Dr. Umperez has used his clinical acumen to develop a research program focused on type 2 diabetes. He's done really groundbreaking work looking at beta cell dysfunction in ketosis prone type 2 diabetes, and most recently has worked on the inpatient management of hyperglycemia and diabetes. And today he's going to speak about the management of hyperglycemia and diabetes in hospitalized patients. Guillermo? Thank you, Bill. Um, hope this is working. 
Uh, and it's a true pleasure and honor to be here. And thank you very much for inviting me. So during the next 45 minutes, I will present to you where we are. And I give you where we are going to go, at least with guidelines, on how we should manage patients with diabetes in the hospital. So I have to present this slide. Um, I've received several investigator initiated studies that some of them will be presented to you. Good or bad, the money goes to Emory, not to my family. So I will discuss first uh, where we are and what the guidance says, what is and how we should care about hyperglycemia in the hospital. And it's my understanding that most of you here are clinicians. So I will discuss with you what are the recommendations, the good and the bad. I think that we have made several mistakes that we're trying to improve in the next few years. And we are asking people to be treated just with insulin. But there are very nice data on alternatives to insulin therapy to manage patients in the hospital. And I'll also discuss with you how we should send this patient home after they are admitted to the hospital. So, better work with this. So this is grand round, so let me start with a couple of cases. So, first patient that you're called to see in the emergency room is a 68-year-old male, 10-year history of diabetes presented with shortness of breath and exacerbation of heart failure. The patient had been treated with metformin and cetagliptin. Not too bad, blood glucose is 172. Uh, I don't have a, a pointer. How do you get the pointer? Here, click here. Got it. I got it. Uh, and the blood glucose is 172. Hemoglobin in one C is just 7.6. Normal kidney function, not too bad. The second patient is a 42, 70, 10 year history of type 2 diabetes, come infected, septic, has a diabetic foot infection, need to have surgery for amputation of the lower extremity. The blood glucose in this patient is close to 300, and the hemoglobin in C is 9.2, saying that he has been uncontrolled for quite some time. The kidney function in this patient is better than the other. So should you treat these two patients in the same way? Well, current guidelines says, yeah, both should be treated with basal ball of insulin therapy. But I'm sure you're thinking that perhaps this patient is very different from this one. And I'll present to you our work and some of the people's work on how we're going to discuss in the next few months. We are right now meeting with the ADA, the Endocrine Society, the American College of Endocrinologists, and we're writing the new guidelines, hopefully to be done sometime later this year. So for the non-diabetologists, this is the epidemic of diabetes. And we have somewhere around 30 million people with diabetes. Three-fourths of them are diagnosed. One-fourth is undiagnosed. And there's about seven to eight million admissions with diabetes every year in the United States, which are associated with significant amount of costs and complications. So when you look at the hyperglycemia in the hospital, this slice is for Curtis Cook from the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And you have here in the top is ICU, and at the bottom is non-ICU. And what it shows here is how many, and this is data in about 12 million people around the country, and we see is the data that how many of them have hyperglycemia. If you define hyperglycemia as a blood glucose greater than 180, 32% have hyperglycemia, and it doesn't matter if they are in the ICU or non-ICU. If you say, well, 180 is not too bad, what about 200? If you define hyperglycemia as 200, it's one out of five patients. So extremely common. So why do we care? Because there are about 50 papers at least that shows that increasing blood glucose concentration in the hospital is associated with increased rate of complications. This is data from our group in 50,000 patients. And I told these statisticians, tell me at what level you see complications. So when is safe or when it you should be worried about? And what you see here is blood glucose coming from 100 all the way to 300. And there is not a threshold. It's a continuous variable. I mean, and you see that the increasing blood glucose concentration is associated 
In this case, a composite of complications that included pneumonia, acute kidney injury, respiratory failure, bacteremia, and death. I could have put more or less of these variables. And they're all the same. Higher the blood glucose, higher the complications. So current guidelines says keep the blood glucose between 140 to 180. So if you see 140, it's about 28% have complications. If you say 180, about 35%. But you can have a blood glucose that is completely normal, 100, and you have 22% complications. So why is that? Because hyperglycemia is not the cause of the complication. It's not that your blood sugar goes up now, you're going to have complication and death. I mean, the average hemoglobin A1C on admission to the hospital is about 8.1 to 8.6. So this patient had been going around, going around for months with high blood glucose and they don't die. Just remember when you were in clinic the last day. I mean, I have several patients with hemoglobin O.C. of 9, 10, and they don't die. So what happens when somebody comes to the hospital is that hyperglycemia favors the complications. So produce endothelial function, produce several mechanisms that we'll discuss in a minute that makes the people who has diabetes to be more prone to have complications. But it's not the cause. More importantly, it's an association, not causation. But the data so far says that higher the blood glucose, higher the complications. For example, this is data from Canada, seven institutions throughout Canada in 2,500 patients with acute pneumonia. And you see that in yellow is complications, in blue is your hospital mortality going from 100 to 250, 300. Higher the blood glucose, higher the complications, especially when the blood glucose is somewhere around 180, 200. This is data from our group in 3,500 patients, 3,200 patients with general surgery, non-cardiac, so the appendix, the hips of this world. And you have in yellow is hyperglycemia or diabetes, and in red, no hyperglycemia, glucose less than 180. In high blood glucose, is associated with perioperative complications like pneumonia, wound infection, acute kidney injury, acute respiratory failure, and even death. And it doesn't matter if you have a patient with or without diabetes. So for the last few years, and we have two of my junior faculties now investigating what we call stress hyperglycemia. So what is this important? Here you have to your left. If patient with diabetes, known diabetics admitted to the hospital, this is data that we had in 11,000 patients undergoing surgery, bariatric surgery and colorectal surgery. And you look here, diabetes, yeah, blood sugars, more than 180, more complications, more reoperation, death. But look to your right. In patient who has stress hyperglycemia, so Mr. Johnson, no diabetic, going bypass surgery, blood sugar goes up. And you see that the rate of complications and death are even more important or more impressive than patients with diabetes. Then the question is why? Why does you don't have diabetes or you have mild diabetes and you come to the hospital, your blood sugar goes to two or three hundred and you have all of these problems? We have no idea. But we speculate, and there are several papers that have shown why, or I speculate, hypothesize why. This is data one of my junior faculty had a care ward. Here is perioperative hyperglycemia, rated than 140. It occurs in one out of three patients in general surgery. And this is more than 180. It's about 12, 14%. And these are the complications and mortality. So what is going on, we don't know. We speculate that the mechanism, hopefully we'll have a response in the next couple of years, that a stress hyperglycemia means a stress hormone release, so what we call contra-regulatory hormones. And these are cortisol, catecholamines, glucagon, and, and growth hormone. So during acute stress, this contra-regulatory hormone result in an increased hepatic glucose production. The major mechanism for stress hyperglycemia is the liver making too much glucose. And also these hormones, an inflammatory response blocks the action of insulin, decreasing glucose uptake in the periphery. So stress hyperglycemia is a combination of increased catecholamine suppressing endogenous insulin release 
and an exaggerated hepatic glucose production and decreased glucose uptake in the peripheral tissues. And the acute hyperglycemia causes decrease inflammatory, an increased inflammatory response, increased reactive oxygen species, and of course, leukocytes, after a few hours of being exposed to high blood glucose, decrease the phagocytic activity. So these are papers published with no good data, and I think in the next few years, our work, and I hope your work, will help us to identify why does having a blood glucose uh, during the perioperative period is associated with increased rate of complications. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. It's not, uh, I got a blank screen. Uh, restart the program, wait for the program to respond. A or B. Okay. <laughs> so, what do we say is hyperglycemia now? We diagnose or we recommend arbitrarily a glucose greater than 140 as a definition of stress hyperglycemia. The current guidelines will suggest that everybody in the hospital has to have a blood glucose tested. And if the blood glucose, they have no history of diabetes, and the blood sugar is less than 140, you're okay. If the blood glucose greater than 140, we recommend you to start testing the patients. Because about 7% of patients who have no diabetes come to the hospital, glucose greater than 140, you do a hemoglobin A1C, and it's greater than 6.5 that qualify for the diagnosis of diabetes, 7%. If you have a history of diabetes, we recommend testing in this patient. A big fight or discussion or debate is how do you define hyperglycemia? Is greater than 140 or greater than 180? We believe it's greater than 140. There are some others that says greater than 180 should be the case. The other thing is what should be the glycemic target? Okay. So the ADA, AIDS, Endocrine Society, we have recommended during the last 10 years to keep the blood glucose less than 140 before meals or, or fasting and one, less than 180 throughout the day. We have no good data suggest that less than 140 is better than less than 180. So two years ago with the American Diabetes Association, we changed this less than 140 to just keep the glucose less than 180. We and others have published papers indicating that it doesn't make any difference. Your blood sugar is 100 to 140 or 140 to 180. It's about the same. So if you shoot for 100 to 120, lower 100, you get more hypoglycemia. So right now, when I used to increase doses with 140, 150, right now I'm okay. I mean, I'm just trying to target the middle of the 100 to 180. That's supposed to be the way, best way. The guidelines that we're going to work is a big debate now. I'm not sure what the final committee is going to say, but this is what I believe. So the most important is the, the avoidance of hypoglycemia. So recommendations for management. So this is where they are in every single guidelines around the world. Insulin should be the way we treat it. Oral agents are not generally recommended and likely because of lack of good data. But if I, I travel around the world giving lectures, I know, for example, in India, 75% of patients are treated with oral agents. In Israel, 60%. In the UK, 40%. Here in the United States, we recommend to be against oral agents. I think that we didn't have data. Now I will present in a few minutes data suggesting that perhaps we should be more flexible in allowing some patients to be managed with some of the oral agents. So the current recommendation says, this is for the house staff, that you have to divide the patients in two big groups. You have to stop oral agents, and then you're going to start insulin, and you have to divide patients in those who are insulin naive versus those who have been previously taken insulin. Remember that those who start insulin type 2 are usually many years until they're starting on insulin, they have less better cell function. So if the patient has not been, uh, and we recommend them to be treated with basal bolus therapy. For those who are insulin naive, so Mr. Johnson never been on insulin, 
you should start the dose of 0.3 to 0.5 units per kilo. So somebody like me, somewhere around 20 to 40 units a day. And you're going to give half of basal and half of prandial insulin. So when do you decide to go to 0.3? The elderly? It's hard to define elderly, that's right. So frailty is more important. So if you see somebody that is at risk of hypoglycemia or a GFR less than 60, you start on 0.3. And it doesn't matter if you start on 0.4 or 0.5 units per kilo. I guarantee to you that at the end is the same low glucose concentration with minor difference in hypoglycemia. If the patient has been on insulin before, the guidelines, and this is what we do in our group, we cut down the dose of insulin because if not, if you don't do that, the rate of hypoglycemia that I will present to you is somewhere around 20 to 30 percent. If you reduce the dose of hypoglycemia, the rate of hypoglycemia is somewhere around 8 percent in, in non-ICU settings. So why is that? Because people in the hospital eat very little. In Atlanta, Georgia, with a BMI somewhere around 33, my patient with type 2 diabetes, the average caloric intake is 1,400 calories a day. They're sick. If you're sick, you don't eat. If you don't eat, you don't need as much insulin despite the level of stress. And in this patient, that's why we recommend reducing the dose by 20 to 30%. And the glucose are about the same in, with less hypoglycemia. So the guideline says to use basal bolus. So for the non diabetologist basal bolus, as you remember, is give one basal dose, large in NPAs, Dermir, and then give insulin before each meal, so three to four injections a day. And, and previously, we used to treat patients with sliding scales. That's right. Uh, so we did a study comparing basal bolus with sliding scales. The first study we did published now 10 years ago. And and the sliding scale, why did we decide a sliding scale? Because it's the way most people manage patients. So I have two daughters, both surgeons, they're experts in sliding scales. <laughs> so, and, and we have been, so the first person who wrote for sliding scale was Elio P. Jocelyn from the Jocelyn Clinic in Boston, 1932. In 1932, they didn't have the insulin that we have now, they have regular insulin. It was non purified. And the number one complication, was convulsions, hypoglycemia. So what he said, he recommended in the third manual of the Jocelyn Clinic, was to give five units for one plus glycosuria, 10 units for two plus glycosuria, three, uh, 15 units for three plus glycosuria. So, and that's the way they used to manage in the 1930s, 1940s. Then we realized that glycosuria is not good. That's right. Uh, so. But in the 1970s, we got the finger sticks. And the, the Kitapchis of this world, the J. Schuylers of this world translated the urine to blood. And we have used sliding scales according to your blood concentration. We have two units, four units, six units. That's right. So we said, OK, let's do basal bolus. It was recommended versus sliding scales. And we took 180 patients. And we treated this patient with sliding scales or with basal balls. So we gave 0.4 or 0.5 units per kilo versus sliding scales. So sliding scales work, yeah, a little bit. And here is 180. As you see, that a blood glucose hang around 180 to 200. So it works from 220, 240 to 180, 200. And basal balls was significantly different after the second days in the hospital. More importantly, we compared the rate of hypoglycemia, and there was no difference. So we concluded, ha, huh, basal ball is better than sliding scales. So then we said, well, bringing the blood glucose down, it's not a big deal, that's right. Can we prevent complications? So we did a study, the first one we call rapid medicine. We said, well, if we want to prevent complications, we should go to surgery. So we had a large group, 200 and something patients, general surgery patients, and we randomized them to sliding scale to the basal ball of 0 0.4, 0 0.5 units per kilo, and we took patients taking oral agents or low dose insulin. And we look for difference in blood glucose concentration, but more importantly, in the composite of complications that included wound infections, pneumonia, respiratory failure, 
acute kidney injury or bacteremia. Blood glucose was better. But more importantly, what I'm showing in this slide is the rate of complications. Here to your left is the composite. So it has all of these complications treated with basal bolus and treated with sliding scales. So a blood glucose of 180, 200 in the perioperative period is associated with threefold increase on the risk of complications, especially wound infections, that makes sense, and the other was acute kidney injury. So we say, huh, I told you, sliding scale is not good. And if you look at hospitalization costs, you save about $1,000 if you stay away from sliding scales in surgical patients. So, so that's why the current recommendation of the ADA Endocrine Society will suggest that we should stay away from sliding scale alone and we should prefer to use basal bolus. So I grew up in South America and many of my friends around the world, especially in India and Africa, they don't have these lantus, derimir, it's so expensive. They still use NPH and regular. So we says, does human insulin, how did they compare to basal bolus? So we have done three studies. I will just summarize them in a couple of slides. Comparing the all NPH and regular, $25 a bottle versus $300 a bottle. So here you have the first study, we call it the DEAN trial, and it was Dedemir with ASPAR, compared to NPH and regular. And you're looking at the blood glucose concentration, and it doesn't matter the color, but the green one is Dedemir, and the pink one is NPH, from admission, randomization, all the way up to day 10, and there's no difference. So why is that? Glu insulin is insulin. If you do a treat to target, give increasing doses of insulin until you bring the blood glucose down, you're going to achieve your target. So there is no difference in, in blood glucose concentration. With them, we said, well, maybe it's the Dedemir that is not good. The other study was Clargin. So we repeated the study. This time we did it in South America, in, in Paraguay. Then we got a, a good group of people here. And what you have here is comparing glargin and glulysine, basal bolus versus MPH and regular. And you're looking at the blood glucose concentration. So insulin is insulin, bringing the blood glucose down. But we saw that there was a higher rate of hypoglycemia, especially severe hypoglycemia. So if you ask me, is Dedemir or Lantus better than MPH? Yeah because you can reduce a little more hypoglycemia rate. But if you are in a country or in a situation like many VA hospital, it's okay to use MPH and regular. Then we say, what about premix? Do you, do you use premix here much in Michigan? Some of you. So there are countries like India, Pakistan, number one insulin, Old Africa, number one insulin, Spain, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. 19% of my patients in the community hospital are treated with 70-30. It's $25 a month. So the question was, if you have a patient with 70-30, should I stop it or should I continue? So how safe they are. So we conducted these studies in Spain because they have a lot of uh, patients with 70-30. And compare basal bolus, the same 0 0.4, 0 0.5 units per kilo, half basal, half bolus, with 70-30 insulin. In Spain, it's called 30-70. And you have the blood glucose concentration is the same. But when you look at the rate of hypoglycemia, it's too much with premixed insulin. As a data safety monitoring board, we say that if we've got more than 50% hypoglycemia, the study should stop. And unfortunately, this number with premixed insulin was too high. So why? Because we made a mistake. We included surgical patients. So my recommendation right now, if you have somebody taking 70, 30, and the patient is eating well, and it's an in and out, it's OK to use it. But if the patient is going to have 1,400 calories average a day of calories, 70, 30, or the patient is going to have surgery, 70, 30 should not be used because of the high rate of hypoglycemia. So let me summarize so far what I told you. So I'm a very competitive person like all of you. And I say, well, what is the best insulin formulation? So I think that basal bolus regimen 
the current recommendation is much better than sliding scales alone, no question. It decreased blood glucose, decreased complications in surgical patients. It's better than 730, less hypoglycemia. And with respect to human insulin, NPH and regular, I'm not very convinced, but it is easier to use and it has less severe hypoglycemia. So I talked to my daughters, one is an orthopedic surgeon and the other is an OBGYN and says, let's use basal balls. And they say, mm, too much hypo, too many blood glucose, too many injections. Maybe I'm doing an overtreatment. So during the last five to six years, we said, well, what about if we look for alternative to these uh, basal balls and maybe we can reduce the use of sliding scales alone. So we have developed two ways. One is called basal plus. Just give a single dose of basal. That's my favorite way of treatment. And the second is look for other agents that are not insulin, oral agents or insulin injectables like GLP-1. And we have done these studies that I will summarize to you. The current recommendation of the Endocrine Society says that you should assess if the patient is going to eat. But who knows who is going to eat? Even a 68-year-old lady? with heart failure, how much is going to eat? It's impossible to know. Or the patient who has surgery. So in this group of people, we are recommended to use a single dose of basal. Just give 0 0.2, 0 0.25 units per kilo. And you do supplement or corrections. If the patient is eating well, you can try basal balls. So we wrote this recommendation before we did the studies, like many times that happened, that's right. So we did these studies, and we did these studies, we call it basal plus, to prove if the recommendations were correct. So we took a group of patients, 370 patients, and we gave a single dose of basal, 0.25, so somebody like me, somewhere around 20, 22 units. And if the blood sugar is greater than 140, I do corrections. If the patient is over, sorry if I'm offending anybody, but if you're over the age of 70, we call you elderly, or if the kidney function is less than 60 or creatinine more than 2, we get just 1.5 units per kilo versus the basal bolus approach, 0.5 units, half and half. And this is what we reported. Here to your left is medicine patients, like almost 200, 100 patients with surgery, and there is no difference in blood glucose comparing basal plus with basal bolus. And here are the blood glucose before meals and at bedtime. So this has led to the last two years for the American Diabetes Association to make the following recommendation. And I think this, they are correct, that we should start a single dose of basal for everybody. Guillermo, I have a patient who's going to have surgery tomorrow. OK, what's the body weight? What's the kidney function? So how much it weighs? 100 kilos. Just give 25 units of basal insulin. And it doesn't matter if you do glargin or deramir, exactly the same. We have done those studies. And then you correct. And if the patient is eating well, you do basal balls, the four shots adjusting to the. And this is what I think is the best way so far that we have to treat patients in the hospital. Now, a limitation is those patients coming with very, very high doses of insulin. That doesn't apply. This only works for a total daily dose of 0.5 units per kilo, so less than 40 units a day. So, what about oral agents? That's right. This has been a fascinating, st evolving story for us. So uh, we said don't use oral agents. So a, a couple of years ago, I asked one of my junior faculty to look at our medical records, how often oral agents are used in the emory system, okay? Not Michigan. This is Georgia. And 24% of the patients in our hospital, despite we are after them all the time, are using oral agents. So I say, mm, so maybe we should do it. We should do studies. That's right. So, so he says, okay, metformin. Mm. Kidney problems, patients, somebody can develop kidney problems or heart failure, hypoxia, lactic acidosis, too many lawyers, no. <laughs> uh, Sulfonylurea, number one is hypoglycemia. If you're not eating, maybe not good. So he said, what about incretin agents, DPP-4? So for the non, uh, or GLP-1, for the non-diabetologists, these agents increase endogenous concentration of a hormone that is called 
glucagon-like peptide that is produced in the intestine, GLP-1. And this endogenous GLP-1 increases insulin release and suppresses glucagon. And it works, both in preprandial and postprandial, mainly postprandial. So we said, maybe we can use that. So we did a, a, a study with Roma here. The, Dr. Jach and Danny worked with us in all of these studies. And we collected these two center studies. We took medicine and surgical patients with a total daily dose of 0.5 units per kilo, so 40 units. And we stopped the insulin. And we randomized this patient. The first was a pilot study. We took the best patients in the world. You cough twice, you're out. So just clean patients. And 30 patients, we gave a little tablet. 30 patients, we gave a tablet and one shot. And the other, we gave the multiple shots. And we did correction for all of them. So when we published this data, before that, you don't know how many times I met with our statistician to review the data over and over again, because I couldn't believe this result. Completely different from our hypothesis, that's right. And, but there was no difference in low glucose concentrations. So we says, well, when we did a sub-analysis of blood glucose concentration, if the blood glucose was less than 180, there was no difference among them. But if the blood glucose is greater than 180, this is cetagliptin alone. And it was 220, 240, it was even worse. So we said, well, maybe in the low hyperglycemia range, a pill works. So we have done some further studies, and then we decided to compare this one tablet, one shot, versus four shots a day, so multiple. Can this facilitate care? And, and we did these studies again with Roma. With, this is 280 patients, medicine and surgical patients. There are four center studies. Uh, and we took patients with diet, oral agents, insulin, to a daily dose of 0.6 units per kilo. So somewhere around 40, 50 units. And we divided one tablet, one pill, multiple shots a day. What you're looking at the left is the mean blood sugar from randomization all the way to the end, and to the right, glucose during the daytime. So we say, well, there you go. So one pill, one shot is equal to multiple shots. So what, how do you explain that? DPP-4 works mainly in postprandial because it suppresses glucagon, because it increases insulin release. So but it's about the same if you give one tablet to three injections before meals. And they said, well, you always don't study with cetagliptin, that's right. What about other DPP-4? So we just reported this, uh, published last month, a linagliptin patient. We took 280 patients, surgical patients, just general surgery. Uh, and again, the same group of people, we just gave linagliptin. Linagliptin is an interesting because you only give one tablet a day. It doesn't matter what your kidney function is. Just give one tablet. It doesn't matter how old you are, one tablet, five milligrams. And the other was basal bolus, and we did correction. And in this patient, here you have the blood glucose concentration. So when we look at the data, and it says, what about the 180 milligrams or 200 milligrams? If you have a blood glucose less than 200 milligrams, it doesn't matter how you treat this patient. If the blood glucose is greater than 200, please don't use oral agents. It doesn't work. They don't work. If, but if you have mild hyperglycemia, this is a possibility. More importantly, because you reduce the risk of hypoglycemia <coughs> by several fold. And the rate of complications lens stays is absolutely the same. So I'm glad that the group at the Brigham's also just published a paper using saxagliptin, the other DPP-4 in the market. And here you have, in a small group of people, very well controlled, with glucose less than 180, that there was no difference in glucose concentration, but you used less insulin, and of course, less hypoglycemia. So where do we stand with this? And this is something that I presented to the committee. I'm not sure what they're going to say. That if you have a patient, if you have a patient presented with a blood glucose less than 200, 180, you can maybe you can okay to use a DPP-4, especially if it's not insulin treated. That's right. 
Or maybe other oral agents. Are, are, we're doing the studies right now. If oral agents can be used. Uh, and maybe you don't have to be giving four shots of insulin to everybody. You can also do basal plus. Then I, if you can tell your surgeon, 70% of my patients in these surgical, surgical patients at Emory now are treated with one single injection of basal insulin, 0.2, 0.25 units. And it works extremely well with most people. Then that would be the same at this one. And if the blood glucose is not good enough, you can combine the two. It's the same for glucose of 2 to 300. But if you have patients, don't use for 200 and oral agents, more than 200. But less than 200, maybe it's okay. If you have severe hyperglycemia or the patient has symptomatic diabetes, you should do basal bolus therapy. And that, this is how I think right now the best way to treat my patients. And we use a lot of DP before alone or in combination with basal bolus. Cleveland Clinic used that every single day and many other hospitals. So in the last section of my talk, in the next five minutes, I'm going to tell you what you do when the patient go home. Okay? So Bill Herman rounds, and it goes with the fellows. They go up by two units, go down by two units, and that's what they do, the endocrinologist. That's right, go four units of insulin. But when the patient, I know, this is what I do with my fellows and residents. So when the patient go home, what do the doctor do? Nothing. Okay? <laughs> so, this is data from Vanderbilt. There's a dispute between Emory and Vanderbilt in the South. So this is data in thousands of patients. 80% of patients, despite having a hemoglobin A1C greater than 8.5, are sent home with the same medicine the patient came to the hospital. It didn't matter if they treated with insulin. They just sent home and they met four minutes of the areas. So, so in the guidelines, we says that's wrong. So, and we said, if the patient has a hemoglobin A1C less than 7, you say, okay, send it home wherever they came. 7 to 9, we says add basal. More than 9, we recommended to do basal bolus therapy. But we didn't have data. So again, these guidelines are written with very little data. So we say, well, let's do these studies. Let's do these studies. And, and here is a study of, of discharge. Less than seven, you came and you sent home whatever you came. Seven to nine, we gave half the dose of basal and we started the oral agents. More than nine, we started discharged the patient with basal balls. Exactly the same as these guidelines. Okay? And what we reported is, well, it works. Look at this. Hemoglobin A1C of 875 to 7.35. Perfect. We felt good. But look at the rate of hypoglycemia here less than 70, you send the patient home in half the dose of insulin or basal bolus therapy. The rate of hypoglycemia was 30 to 44% within three months of discharge. This is unacceptable. So I don't think that we need to be sending home everybody on insulin. You should reach the oral agents. So, so we have done multiple analyses of this and other data of discharge that we have done. And the problem is in the study design. So we recommended to send home with 50% patients with hemoglobin A1C between 7 to 9. That's a mistake. Because patients, when they go home, they don't eat well. And you're still limping around, that's right. You have a baby, the next day you're home. So patients are not right, they're not eating well. So our current recommendation, hopefully it will be accepted for the new guidelines, is that don't send a patient home with insulin unless the hemoglobin A1C may be 7.5, 8. I don't know what is the right number, but it's not 7. So if you send home a patient with glucose of 180 to 100 hemoglobin A1C or 7.2, 40% develop hypoglycemia, which may recur and have more admission to the hospital. The other alternative, if what Roma published, is why do you have to use insulin? So maybe you can do metformin, cetagliptin, or this combination of metformin with something else. And what she reported is that you do metformin, cetagliptin, you have a very nice reduction of hemoglobin A1C. So I just want to call your attention that not everybody needs to go on high doses of insulin. Even half the dose of insulin is associated 
with increased rate of hypoglycemia. So let me summarize what I've done or what I've learned in the last few years. Okay? I know I presented a lot of data. So first, should this patient be treated in the same way? So the first patient was the 68-year-old with heart failure. Hemoglobin was 7.8. The other is a fully diabetic, septic, very blood, high blood glucose. So this patient maybe can be treated continuing the cyclicliptine and see how it does. This patient for sure needs a basal bolus. So we're going to call for individualization of care in the hospital, the same that we are doing in the outpatient setting. Second, there's a strong relationship between high blood sugar and complication, but it's not the cause. It's an association. So it doesn't matter if the patient has diabetes or not. High blood glucose, you should pay attention, especially in a non-diabetic that is associated with even higher rate of complications. They are in very much stress. Uh, so my daughter is now finally just now one graduate is in practice, so she's using basal insulin. But the use of sliding scales is good in patients who has very, very mild hyperglycemia. In most patients, it doesn't work. And more importantly, it's associated with increased rate of complication. So we are in the, we have even an algorithm, an app for the surgical anesthesiologists at Emory to push them to use a single dose of basal. So if there's one message for you to take home, is 0.2, 0 0.25 units of basal, that's it, that's it. And it works in most people, except for those who are taking high doses of insulin. And it reduced the dose of complications significantly. So 0 0.2, 0 0.25 units per kilo. And finally, there's no difference in glucose concentrations. And finally, when the patient go home, it, maybe above 7.5, 8, you should send the patient home with insulin if they are not being treated before with insulin. If not used like Roma indicated, combination of oral agents not associated with hypoglycemia because the patients are not well when they go to the hospital. Now, what about oral agents? We only have data in randomized controlled trials, now over about 1,000 patients using DPP-4 in different forms. And it works for a patient who has blood sugar less than 180, 200. Above that level, insulin is the best way to go. So this is, I know this is your uh, research day. So I just want to give you some ideas of how many much opportunities there is for young people like you to do research. So we are working right now in oral agents. Can we use the old metformin? Well, why not? We're going to test that in a very controlled setting. We should. It will cost a significant amount of money. That's right, $5 versus $500 a month. We just completed studies using this long-acting insulin. The U300 and Deglutec will be presented at the ADA. Does the new insulin help or not? My bottom line to you on the iron embargo is they help very little. Just the old glars and the old Deramir are as good as the new insulin comfort medications. We are working on prevention of stress hyperglycemia. So I told you that if you don't have diabetes, your blood sugar goes high, you have more complications. But we have no idea why that occurs, who is at risk, and more importantly, can you prevent that to happen? So with a glucagon like the GLP-1 injection and other agents, we're going to do that. And more importantly, I think the future of medicine is technology, that's right. We have right now three studies using continuous glucose monitoring. So we assess glucose control with finger sticks, three, four times a day. It, can we put a meter, a CGM, and then just the nurse will go room by room and don't have to be pricking fingers? Or I have a, a, one of my junior faculties now with the VA merit, uh, that we transmit the information from the CGM to the nurse station. And we have an iPad. And the same as cardiology, most of the health staff would become cardiologists. This is glu continuous glucose monitoring. So we have the whole term monitor, 
and the continuous glucose management. <laughs> so, and if the blood glucose less than 80, the nurse goes to the room and prick the fingers with an attempt to prevent hypoglycemia. Would this be the way to the future? It, you don't be pricking fingers. Just put one of these things and then the nurse station will have that. Maybe that's the way to go. I, I really don't know, but we will present this data sometime in the next few years. And the final thing is insulin pumps. And this is my call to Roma and her team. Nobody in the world have done ever a study on type 1 diabetes in the hospital. Let me repeat this. There is not a single randomized controlled study in type 1 diabetes. You have a type 1 diabetes center. And we are still working on type 1 now. Uh, but we need more people joining us because we have no idea how to manage a patient with type 1 diabetes in the hospital. So I know I presented a lot of data, and I hope that I can answer any question. Uh, if somebody wants a copy of this slide, my secretary would be happy to send it to you. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, Bill. Um, yeah, we do have time for questions, but probably uh, we want to present the plaque. I just want to say on behalf, uh, on behalf of the Department of Internal Medicine for our Internal Medicine Research Symposium, thank you for your wonderful you. comments and uh, our learning of uh, some uh, more in the diabetes. So thank you for being our keynote speaker this, uh, today. Thank you very much. Thanks, well, So questions uh, for Dr. Pierce? Yeah. Okay, let me come over here. Question. We'll start with David. Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks. That was uh, terrific. I have a question specifically uh, with the stress-induced hyperglycemia. You know, uh, of course, you use uh, clinically DPP-4 inhibitors quite a bit, and you probably know that DPP-4 actually has multiple facets to its life, and one of which is that it can actually cleave cytokines and uh, inactivate them and make a dominant negative version of the cytokine. So because this uh, stress hyperglycemia looks so much like a stress reaction, do you have any data to suggest that you might be able to use a DPP-4 inhibitor yeah. to treat that? I didn't present this data because of time, but we have done two studies. Uh, and we says, can we give a DPP-4 before, before surgery, uh, the day before surgery, and every day, and see if you can prevent stress hyperglycemia, and maybe you can reduce complications. So we did a study, two pilot studies, of both of them with 100 patients, one in coronary and bypass surgery, and the other general surgery. And the answer is they don't work. Do, both of them fail. So we published one, the other is under review. It's hard to publish negative studies. But nevertheless, we try because it, what we're doing now is we're going to use a dulaglutide. So DPP-4 increased GLP-1 GLP concentration by two to three folds. GLP-1 increased GLP-1 concentration by tenfold. And we have data, preliminary data, that if you give dulaglutide in seven patients, enough to get the cramps, uh, you can prevent the elevation of blood glucose, and it works in 24 or 48 hours. So we are giving the dulaglutide, and this is a K award for one of my junior faculties, three days before surgery. And we're seeing if we can prevent, I mean, if we can prevent stress hyperglycemia in the cardiovascular surgery, you will avoid insulin adjustment every hour, finger sticks every hour. Man, you will save tons of money. Uh, so, but I tell you in a couple of years, not in order. So. It didn't work. Yeah. For inpatients who are started on um, glucocorticoids, do your algorithms and uh, regimens uh, favor one or the other? Yeah. Let me show you this. This is the our Emory day. We have this algorithm. Who knows? The, and we divide the patients in two groups: those who have no history of diabetes and those with history of diabetes. So. If you have somebody with hyperglycemia, and, and the hyperglycemia has to be more than 180 to 200 more than a few times. And we start on NPH. Uh, well, the problem with steroids 
is that it's so hard to study because the dose that you use for a COPD exacerbation, 40, 50 milligrams of prednisone, is different from rejections. So that's the problem with steroids, is how to study them. But if you're going to use for COPD exacerbation for oral steroid, we prefer to use, uh, 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 you can do large and Dedamir, or you can just use NPH. And there is data suggesting that NPH is better than glargin for oral prednisone in this patient. So we start in 0 0.1, 0 0.2 units per kilo. And, and if that's not enough, we combine basal with NPH. And there are several, several studies that this combination of basal, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, with 0 0.1, 0.2 of NPH in the morning for prednisone-induced hyperglycemia is much better than to do basal bolus therapy. There are several studies suggesting that this is our protocol. Guillermo, um, there's a question from remote audience asking about many patients leave the hospital and go to subacute care, not home. Do you have any recommendations yeah. for a, a SNF facility or a nursing home? Uh, we have been, this is the, the studies on long-term care has been an area of investigation from our group for the last five years, and we have a couple of grants on that. Uh, avoid using insulin as much as possible. That's my bottom line. If you can combine a DPP-4 with metformin or agents not associated with hypoglycemia, they, they do as well as basal insulin. In a study published last year, uh, 300 patients, linagliptin once daily with or without metformin resulted in similar glycemic control compared to glargin therapy. So why is that? So if any one of us ended in, ends in a nursing home, you are 80s, okay? You don't want to eat today, you don't eat. If you didn't want the dessert, you eat the dessert. And nobody can force it, that's the problem. You cannot, if you do insulin, the rate of hypoglycemia with insulin was 30%. If you use a DPV-4 with or without metformin, it was 3%. So uh, that's the bottom line. I, I mean, the bottom line in the nursing home is avoid insulin if you can. And if you're going to start insulin, never start more than 0.1 units per kilo. So seven units, eight units, six units, 10 units is more than enough. Huh? Guillermo, that was a great talk. How do you, uh, what's the strategy for gathering your data post-discharge? And uh, who do you decide that you're going to see again uh, and you know, kind of personally follow up? For research or in real life? Uh, real life. Real life. So, <laughs> So we have a diabetes management program. And if the hemoglobin A1C is greater than nine, uh, it comes to a diabetes management program and a CDE or a nurse practitioner calls this patient within two weeks to assure that the patient is, is okay. So we just found out when we started this two years ago that now we use pens, that's our doctors are using pens. 22% of the patient discharged from the hospital on pens the doctor didn't write for needles. <laughs> so, so, so why is that? I mean, pharmacy, what's wrong with you? There are different pharmaceutical companies, or different makers. So we didn't bundle. Now we bundle. I mean, now you cannot send by the home with pen unless you're written for needles. But that resulted in an increased number of readmissions. So, so we have decided that everybody with hemoglobin was here greater than nine, somebody who called this patient, and we can invite them to the diabetes management program. Uh, and for research, we're trying to learn, so we're do, doing a lot of CGM studies after the discharge. I think uh, because of time, I want to say a few thank yous. First of all, I want to thank Ben Margolis for helping organize this. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. I also... I also want to thank the Fiennes family for coming to this uh, wonderful and annual lecture. <laughs> also, I want to thank Lisa Miller and the GME staff uh, for help organizing uh, uh, running, uh, the research day for our residents, as well as Jim Auger and uh, partners in our chair's office. I want to thank them for their work today. <laughs> and lastly... Lastly, I want to thank uh, Dr. Guillermo Imperis for being a Fiennes visiting professor today, as well as for Research Day. I want to thank you. And yeah. there is posters right after this with dessert. 
uh, followed by resident talks over in the Towsley. So don't, uh, don't leave our residents hanging. Thank you very much. <laughs>